Today's movie is called D1. <laughs> Hello and welcome. Today we're watching D1. <laughs> welcome to Fiction Addiction, where we're watching the movie D1. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. I just needed that out of my system, and I'm sorry to be immature, but D War, really? D War is a Korean action blockbuster from 2007, in the sense that it's directed by a Korean man and is based on Korean legends. Although it takes place in Los Angeles and stars primarily American actors, detailing a war between good and evil dragons attempting to claim an ancient power for their own. Now, I'm not specifically a fanboy of dragons per se, but they are all over a lot of things I like, and they are undeniably awesome mystical creatures that have had surprisingly few movies made about them specifically. And hey, the idea of dragons attacking a modern city does sound pretty rad. And besides, how can I say no to a movie that proudly boasts that it is just as impressive as Transformers, or that it is just like King Kong but with missiles? So, you've convinced me, New York Times. Let's give Phallic Initial Wars a go. So the movie gives us the basic premise right away in the opening credits. Apparently, every 500 years, a chosen woman is born that will grant great power to a serpent, which will then become a celestial dragon. A good serpent will use this mighty power to protect the universe. An evil serpent will use the mighty power to destroy the world. Now I shall destroy the universe. <laughs> uh, what we do then, boss? Uh, hmm. I hadn't really thought about it, actually. In modern-day LA, some manner of earthquake has unearthed a huge foreign item that suspiciously looks like a giant scale. And our hero here, a young reporter named Ethan, starts to get weird magical visions after seeing it. We then soon get a flashback to his childhood 15 years prior, when his father dragged him to a Korean pawn shop. He went off to snoop a bit while his father haggled with the shop owner until... Sensing this happen, the shopkeeper tries to get the dad out of there and fakes a heart attack. Ethan! What happened? Watch him, watch him, I'll be, I'll be right back. You, child, stay here and watch this dying elderly man unsupervised. Finally, I found you. That is not something you want to hear a strange man say the instant your father leaves the room. So he tells Ethan that what he saw was a scale of the great Imugi, the good serpent, and briefly repeats the legend from the beginning, but adds some more detail. Basically, a goddess named Yu-Gi-Oh, um, I'm sorry, yu gi has the power to grant celestial dragon status to great serpents. However, the evil serpent Buraki covets it, which causes the gods to decide to hide it on earth to be born in a human woman, accompanied by two of heaven's finest warriors, Haram and his master, Bochun. Unfortunately, the evil Buraki also knew where to find yu gi So the supposedly almighty gods clearly did a pretty shit job of hiding her. And so, in 1500s Korea, a girl named Narim is born with a dragon mark on her shoulder, and as she and Haram grow up together, they very much fall in love. There's just one problem. Once she turns 20, she is destined to give her life in order to give her power to either the good dragon Imugi, who apparently just kinda chills in the sea and does tricks whenever Botrun asks, or the wicked Buraki. And as you can imagine, Haram is not too keen on either idea. Not surprisingly, on the day of Narim's birthday, a servant of Buraki attacks the village with his army of mounted raptors and shoulder bazooka dinosaurs. Holy shit! So the battle continues in a new place in time with Dino Riders. And so war happens. And since our Korean writer and director knows his blockbusters, it won't be complete without what else? A Wilhelm scream. <laughs> seen a lot of strange movie deaths, but I gotta admit getting squished by a shoulder bazooka dinosaur is a new one. Of course, Haram and Butchum pull out their heavenly martial arts to try and save Nareem from the army, which apparently parked their bazooka dragons on the other part of town. But while Butchum fights like a madman, Haram decides to be all host before bros, ditches his guardian amulet and tries to run away with Nareem. 
This goes about as well as you expect running from a giant monster serpent will, and the two throw themselves in the water, choosing suicide over giving themselves to Baraki. I know this isn't easy to believe, but do you want to know something that's even harder to believe? These sick guns, bro! Yeah, I lift. I am Bo Chun, from 500 years ago, and you, you are Hadam, very warrior I raised. Ah, there it is. Ethan is actually the reincarnation of Haram and is destined to meet the new incarnation of Yuiju, this time named Sarah, when she turns 20. And with that information, Butchun gives him Haram's amulet and tells him to be ready when the day comes. Because why wouldn't the Korean goddess of dragons reincarnate herself as a white American girl? You see, that way she is absolutely certain that everyone will care when she needs rescuing. So, back in present day, as Ethan remembers all of this and connects the dots, he somehow convinces his co-worker Bruce to help him track her down by ranting about saving the girl, expecting him to just understand any of that. Well, she has a, a tattoo on her shoulder, and she's 20 years old. No, I mean, she's still 19. I have a strong sense she's still in the city. Okay, a 19-year-old girl with a tattoo in Los Angeles. You're killing me, man. That describes every 19-year-old girl in L.A. No, I mean, this girl was born with a mark shaped like a dragon. Boy, you're always making shit up, I swear. And yet you humor him by helping him stalk a stranger at work during your shift. I sure hope you guys don't need those paychecks because I'm pretty sure there are a couple of pink slips somewhere in that office with your names on them. In a gym somewhere in LA, we finally meet Sarah, who gets shaken up when she sees a report about the scale that was dug up. This causes her to hurry home to that insanely swanky ass apartment she can obviously afford and dig out that Korean book of mysticism she obviously has. And when her friend goes to check on her, she's gone a little bit batty. I'm telling you, something really bad is gonna happen. Maybe that weird accident on TV just got to you a little bit. Why yes, I always plaster my walls with Eastern mysticism when the news upset me a little. Don't you? And of course, with Sarah's birthday fast approaching, other mysterious things start to happen around town. <laughs> you gotta admire her confidence. Well, if he can do it, I don't see why I shouldn't be able to. This is why my children don't miss it anymore. This guy is Baraki's henchman, who apparently also has the time to lead his giant dragon snake to the zoo so he can snack on an elephant and scare the crap out of a random zookeeper. But does he have time to give us a name? Uh, no. Somehow, Sarah's friend convinces her to go out on the town in order to relax, but she quickly leaves, only to be immediately accosted by three rapists in the making. At least right until Butchon saves her and then just... walks away. Oh look, it's the reincarnation of the goddess I've waited five centuries for. I should probably bring her somewhere safe. Ah, I'll do it tomorrow. Not surprisingly, the police don't particularly believe Sarah's story about a mysterious old man beating up thugs. Or the zookeeper's story about a giant elephant eating snake. And I swear to you, the elephant disappeared into the snake's throat. I mean, this thing stared at me like my ex-wife. You see, it's, it's funny because marriage is terrible. But another reporter does spot Sarah at the station and shares her story with Ethan and Bruce when he returns to the office. This instantly convinces Ethan that this girl must be the Sarah he's looking for. Well, of course she is! I mean, martial arts were involved! That's... That is an Asian thing, right? Sarah tries to leave the police station. But suddenly, her car mysteriously grows scales, right as Bunraki's enforcer shows up, and it's a dream sequence. Can't make things too interesting too fast. In reality, she's actually quarantined at the hospital because someone believed her dragon mark to be a rash, which doesn't make Ethan's attempt to visit her, which he for some reason expects hospital staff to be cool with, any easier. But never mind the plot. I'm sure you're just dying to know how the zookeeper is doing. A snake tossed a two-ton elephant straight into the air and then swallowed it whole. That's how enormous it was. Mr. Belafonte. Damn! I like Discover Channel a lot, too. Never have I seen a snake such as what you're describing. Try to recall again. Yeah, but have you seen the giant ass snake wrapping itself around the entire hospital? No? Well, you're not alone, cause apparently so has no one else in all of LA. 
Ethan manages to convince a doctor, who turns out to actually be Butcher in disguise, to let him see Sarah and help them escape when the giant fucking dragon snake finally lets its presence be known. Buraki absolutely wrecks the place chasing them, and they all run to Bruce's car and narrowly escape the collapsing parking garage. Bruce is understandably freaked out by all this, and kind of forgets to watch the road. And once he has shaken off the embarrassment from that one, the villain turns into his armored form and Bruce and Ethan fight him to keep him away from Sarah, with predictable results. <laughs> Our big scary villain everybody! He finally gets to act and he gets run over! TWICE! IN THE SAME SCENE! The right hand man of the dark serpent Bunraki. Undone by a complete failure to comprehend traffic. Baby monkey was a little and sweet. Baby monkey tried to cross the street. He looked to the left and looked to the right. And when the traffic was done, he stepped off the curb and was hit by a bus and not the kingdom come. Thanks, Rip. Are you going to be all right here? We'll be fine. Just make sure you get out of town. What? What about Bruce? Where is he? I'm sure Bruce is fine. WHAT?! WHERE DID YOU PUT HIM?! Guys, I didn't edit this. This movie actually goes directly from Ethan running over the bad guy and picking up Sarah, to him and Sarah being passengers in some strange woman's car with no idea where the fuck Bruce is. Oh, and the woman turns out to be Butchern again. What happened?! When did they switch cars?! Where did Bruce go?! When did Butchern show up?! WHY ISN'T HE JUST JOINING THEM AND HELPING THEM DIRECTLY IF IT'S HIS LITERAL MISSION FROM HEAVEN TO DO SO?! I mean, did, did I miss a scene or something? What? Blah blah blah, Ethan and Sarah fall in love on the beach because destiny and junk, and we get to see the agents from earlier in the movie discussing the various strange reports they've received about giant reptiles. When it's pointed out that it's kind of similar to an old legend, we get this gem. A legend. You're asking me to believe in some monster from a legend. I know we don't have much time, but is this really the best that the Bureau can come up with? A legend? No, I'm asking you to believe in the hundreds of feet long giant dragon snake that wrecked the hospital! How did nobody see that?! But hey, at least one of them takes the threat seriously! Alright, everybody, come on! Michaels, let's go! Never leave home without my boomstick! No matter if they believe or not, they're quick to send armed forces when they realize Bunraki's henchman has summoned an army headed for LA. They, um, don't handle the situation that well, though. Aim for the shields, men! We'll wear them down eventually! Ethan takes Sarah to some professor friend he apparently has, who manages to hypnotize her into recalling memories from her past life. Which activates her power, which in turn attracts Bunraki, which causes it to completely wreck the professor's house while our heroes leave him to die. So long and thanks for all the fish, asshole. Once safe, they meet up with Bruce, who has apparently just been chilling at work this whole time, and get him to secure a news helicopter they can escape in. Somehow. Even Butchum briefly shows up to remind Ethan that he cannot defy fate again, and that Sarah will have to sacrifice herself. And that's when Bunraki strikes again, having apparently gone completely unnoticed until he hits the cafe. Well, now things are getting chaotic, and when Bruce tries to help them escape by car again, Bunraki is not having it. Okay, no, that's not what happens, but that would have been hilarious. Ethan and Sarah manage to get to the Arnold Schwarzenegger quote and try to escape, but Bunraki quickly scales the building and grabs a hold of it prompting the two of them to once again leave innocents to die as they jump to safety. And that's when the cavalry arrives. Would I be right in assuming that this is where the King Kong but with missiles part comes in? Yep, it sure is! Rocky's henchman has had enough and summons his whole dragon army to attack Los Angeles. And just like that, we've finally gotten to the war part of D-War. And I have to admit it's pretty awesome. 
The next 10 minutes is almost nothing but dragons fighting soldiers, and it's easily the coolest part of the movie, if also pretty much one of the most pointless. So, you know what? I'm not even gonna comment. I'm just gonna show you a couple highlights. <laughs> During the chaos, the National Defense guys somehow managed to spot Ethan and Sarah and take them to a warehouse. We know about you, Iju. Department has a very sophisticated paranormal unit. Well, I didn't expect to have to make this reference two episodes in a row, but... The leader then promptly shoots Sarah to stop the conflict. However, Ethan takes the bullet and the dude's underling shoots him instead because he actually believes in the legend, and he sends the two running since Ethan is apparently completely impervious to gunshot wounds. So, this whole scene, and by extension the entire national defense plot is... completely pointless then? Okay, good to know. Ethan and Sarah decide to escape the madness by driving off to Mexico. I'm not even kidding, they literally say that's what they're doing. And Sarah reveals that, indeed, today is her 20th birthday. And as if on cue, the dragon army catches up to them and start firing away! Uh, guys, I think you might be taking the blowout part of birthday blowout a little too seriously. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to you! Well, they manage to flip the car and capture Ethan and Sarah, who eventually wake up in fucking Mordor from the looks of it. And apparently nobody thought it was wise to actually kill Yuji's guardian instead of just tying him up. It's all looking pretty grim as the nameless big bad villain man summons Bunraki to let it feed on Sarah. But that's when Ethan's guardian amulet decides to actually do a thing and obliterates the entire dragon army. Seemingly just as a side effect of... burning Ethan's robes off? Which, while it wouldn't have killed a bunch of dragon soldiers that's granted, could have been accomplished by just... Well, not surprisingly, big scary Watchamadoinkle armor man, who was somehow not disintegrated, is pissed and it turns into a sword fight. <laughs> Oh man, there's no way I can win this fight! If only I had a car! But nah, Ethan's amulet saves the day again and disintegrates the bad guy when he hits it. Problem is that there's still Bunraki to deal with. At least until Imugi finally appears out of whatever SeaWorld aquarium he was entertaining and joins the fray. Time for a giant snake fight! I feel like the sight of two giant snakes furiously rubbing against each other sets itself up perfectly for a joke, but I can't for the life of me figure out what that joke would be. Bunraki appears to be winning, at least until Sarah decides that enough is enough and simply summons forth the Yujiju from within and feeds it to Imugi. He turns into a classic Eastern Celestial Dragon and starts absolutely tearing Bunraki apart, eventually defeating him with a fireball. But, alas, just as the legend foretold, it cost Sarah her life. And a couple hours in the makeup chair to get a swanky new hairdo so her ghost can say goodbye. Ethan, don't be sad. I'll love you for all of eternity. We'll be together again. As Force Ghost in the next Star Wars remaster. And with that, Imugi eats Sarah's spirit and flies off to the heavens, leaving Ethan heartbroken and alone in a desolate mystical wasteland. A wasteland where he will spend his final days realizing that he once again caused the deaths of thousands of people by dragging the one thing that could stop the war all over the state until he eventually dies of thirst and starvation. Happy ending for everyone! Whew, okay. Look, I can think of a lot of things that D&D &D war might stand for, but Dragon certainly isn't one of them. Dumb, disastrous, desperately trying to be cool, downright idiotic, all of them are better descriptors. This had the potential to be super cool, and has some pretty decent monster CGI for the time, but it's trying so hard to shove every fantasy trope in there it can, along with badly shoehorned romantic plots and shitty characters and scenes that go nowhere other than to fill a quota. It is an incoherent mess with more holes than your average pair of fishnet stockings. But it can be hilarious. Provided you had some booze and a group of wisecracking friends. There's really not much else to say about D-War. Do you like terrible monster movies? Then this is definitely one of the wilder ones. But if you're looking for actually genuinely awesome dragon action, 
you should probably look elsewhere. Bye for now, everybody. Hi everyone, and thanks for watching me rant about this disastrous dragon movie. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to press the like button and leave a comment below, possibly about some of your own favorite dragons. There's more like this coming. And if you can't wait for that, have no fear. By supporting me on Patreon, you can get access to my work in progress feed for videos and other projects, such as the Usagi Ojimbo fan comic I'm currently working on titled The Funny Man. By donating, you can read new pages of the comic in advance, as well as see preview clips for videos, sketches, and other good stuff. Just check the link in the description to learn more. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to say some special thanks to John Aljets, Keith McRae, Warren Miller, and Andreas Strauss, as well as my other patrons for their support. It's super flattering, you guys. Thank you. And if you're new, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and click the little bell to be notified when the next video is done. And I will see you there. Bye for now.